Good evening, everyone. Um, well, welcome to you. Let me add my welcome to Philips. Um, we're starting a new series this evening, post-Easter, for the next six weeks. We'll be doing something a little bit different. Don't worry, not that different. We'll still be looking at the Bible. We'll still be hearing what God has to say uh, to us in the place that he has spoken authoritatively and clearly. But instead of wor working our way through a book of the Bible, um, chapter and verse at a time, uh, we'll be taking a topic to look at that instead. And the topic that we'll be looking at in this series is what uh, theologians and philosophers call anthropology. Sounds like a scary word. It really isn't. All it means is the study of man, the study of humanity. In other words, we're asking that question, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be a human being? And so for this series, over the next six weeks, um, we've prepared some um, booklets which have um, some recommended resources, books to read on the back for further uh, study and investigation, um, an introduction to the series, a glossary of terms, um, because there is some language over the next six weeks which we might not be that familiar with, and then sermon outlines and the Bible texts for the six weeks. So if you want um, one of those, they're in the uh, foyer. There's some large print versions for the more ocularly challenged of us as well. Um, I can include myself in that. Um, <clears throat> so that's where we are. Why are we looking at this particular topic and why now? Two reasons. First, our society has undergone a ground shift over the past 10 to 20 years. Um, Society of late has been marked by something called the culture wars, uh, wars in wider society between those who are um, liberal in their cultural persuasion and wanting change, and those who are more socially conservative. The world, in, in fact, is becoming increasingly hostile, or the Western world at least, is becoming increasingly hostile to those who hold socially conservative values particularly around the topics of uh, sexuality and gender. With regard to these topics, the liberal left shouts tolerance as its manifesto, and yet it be is becoming um, increasingly intolerant in a deeply ironic way uh, to anyone who is conservative, to anyone who disagrees or dissents. And people who express those kind of opinions find themselves cancelled victims of cancel culture, a term that none of us knew of even five years ago. Take the famous example from, I believe it was uh, two years ago now, of JK Rowling, who made the mistake of saying something online. If sex isn't real, she said, there's no same-sex attraction. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. I know and love trans people, but erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. It isn't hate to speak the truth. She had this whole series of tweets effectively saying that men who transitioned to identify themselves as women were not women. An you know, a statement that 10, 15, 20 years ago would have been blindingly obvious to the entire world. And yet, say something like this now and defend the right for a woman to enter a public restroom, bathroom, and not feel at risk that a man self-identifying as a woman might be in the stall next to her, and you receive comments like this. I wish you a very nice pipe bomb in your mailbox. Or she had to post something like this later on in the year. Last Friday, my family's address was posted on Twitter by three um, activist actors who took pictures of themselves in front of our house, carefully positioning themselves um, to ensure that our address was visible. That's one tweet of eight that were to go on explaining um, various horrible things um, that were being incited against her all simply for stating something which biologists have known and believed for centuries. And in fact, the whole world has believed from the beginning that a man dressed up as a woman is not a woman, but a man. Even saying that now, 
I slightly risk being counted as having spoken something hateful. In fact, such is the world that we live in that, that radical feminist Jermaine Greer, you know, the, the face of feminism of the 20th century, was recently no platformed from Cardiff University for being too conservative because of her views about uh, women and transgender issues in particular. She was due to speak on a topic called Women in Power in the 20th Century, something that she's um, amply qualified to speak about. And 2,000 students, led by the women's, ironically, the women's officer of the Students' Union at Cardiff University, wrote a petition saying that she wasn't welcome because her views were harmful to trans women. A complete ground shift. What on earth is going on? But then also we're turning um, to look in the life of the Church of England to um, and something called living in love and faith, where the church is seeking, um, asking individual parish churches to seek God's will with regard to two particular issues, with regard to same-sex marriage and with regard to people who feel as though they don't belong in the, the body. People who feel as though they want to make that journey to try and transition from one um, gender to another. We'll come back and think about both of those things more later on in the series. But one final thing by way of introduction, and I realise it is a long introduction, sorry, it's the introduction to the whole series. Um, one final thing, I was chatting to a vicar um, at Christmas time, and he had been looking at um, this kind of stuff with his congregation from September uh, through to Christmas, and he said he was one of the, the biggest regrets that he had about the impact of uh, his preaching series was that the congregation kind of got there begrudgingly. They were like, oh, we know this is what the Bible says, but we, we kind of feel as though we have to believe it rather than you know, not being ashamed that this is good news, that because God is the source of all goodness, what he has to say in his word is good for us. I don't want that to be the situation for us. I, I want to not just say, this is what God says, take it or leave it. I want to persuade us that what God has to say about sex and gender in a world which thinks radically differently is actually really good news for us and is really good news for society. Daft illustration, this is a floor steamer. Haley and I got one not long after we got married. It might even have been a, a wedding gift from someone. It turns out that on a floor steamer, there's a really important little net type thing that goes over the top that basically stops all the water or the steam kind of condensing and spraying water all over the floor. And Muggins here decided it was a good idea not to read the maker's instructions the first time, a few times that I used it. Um, and I thought it was going um, swimmingly, to pardon the pun, um, until the water ended up all over the floor. Then I kept doing it. It turns out that when you don't listen to what the maker has to say about how to use the piece of machinery, um, disaster ensues. And that is a daft illustration. Can you imagine if we ignored what God, our maker, had to say about how we use our bodies? It would be disastrous, wouldn't it? Our precious bodies that God has given to us as a gift, we must listen to what he has to say, because what he says is for our good. Right, that really is the introduction over. And now we're, we're diving into our first topic for this evening, and that is about our bodies. Who am I? And what does it mean for me uh, to be a human being? And so uh, this question is essential for us to look at, because um, at the end of the day, to understand how we should live, we first need to get a grip with who we are. Before I understand um, what I ought to do as a human being, I need to understand who I am as a human being and what God's expectations of me are, because those expectations will be fitted to my nature. What I am as a human being will shape um, the way that I am to act. And one of the absolutely crucial things that underlies so much of the confusion that exists today is the relationship between me and this thing, this flesh, my body. Um, there's various different ways of thinking about this that exist in the world. 
There are some people on one end of the spectrum. That is an arrow going across with a point at the end, but I realized that the points are really small, so it's like, they look like dots. On one end of the spectrum, you have people who basically say, my body is the real me. There is no such thing as a spirit or a soul. The body is all that there is. And once you die, you're buried six feet under and there is no more. You kind of think classic natural scientism. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people who effectively say, your body doesn't matter at all. It isn't the real you. There is an inner self, whether you want to call it your soul or your spirit, or, or some other term, but that inner self is the real you. And the way that that finds itself expressed in so much of our society today is in the fact that you are what you feel yourself to be. That is the mantra of the younger generations of our society today. What you inwardly feel yourself to be, oh, that's the real you. It doesn't matter objectively if your body might say otherwise. Your body isn't the real you. It's just a bit of a, a prison, maybe, for the real you, which is your inner self, your desires, your feelings. Now, as soon as we start thinking about desires and feelings, we get to the point of realizing that we're in trouble because the Bible says things about our hearts being deceitful above all things, that our feelings aren't a reliable source of reality. And neither of these extremes is Christian. God gives us a different reality. The real me is in the middle. It's neither of those two extremes. It's not just my soul, it's not just my body, it's both. As a human being, you are a body and a soul, or an embodied soul. Often it's been talked about in the Christian tradition. Genesis 2 verse 7, which Rosemary read to us, thanks for getting the doors. Um, Genesis 2 verse 7 is a good example that illustrates this. Um, dualism at the heart of who I am as a human being. The Lord God formed, uh, literally, Adam, the man, or a man, from the dust of the ground, body, from the dust of the ground, body. And then he does something unique, which he didn't do with any of the other animals. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, there's an interesting wordplay in Hebrew, um, that the word for breath, ruach, is the same word for spirit. Um, God breathes his spirit into the man. And so you have a, a combination in the first man, a living being, who is both from the dust, embodied, has a body, but also has the breath, the spirit of life. And so a human being is a unique creation of a body and spirit or um, often theologians have talked about the spirit when it, when it takes a body as being a soul, body and soul. We find this reinforced throughout the Bible in various different books. So take Jesus um, talking uh, to his disciples where he um, is en encouraging them to be bold witnesses. And he says to them this, don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Two parts of a human being, body and soul. Or well, the psalmist, he cries out to God, be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. The two parts of the human being used together for, as, a, as a sum for the whole. Body and soul together, the full human being. Or take Job, I think it's Eliphaz he's speaking at this point. And he says, so that their body finds food repulsive and their soul loathes the choicest meat. It's the same thing. What is a human, whole human being, body and soul together? So you cannot conceive of yourself as a human being rightly in God's eyes without thinking about your soul, the fact that there's more than your body, but also your body. What does it mean in conclusion? Well, our bodies really matter. Your body is really you. It's not just something that you can kind of strip off and the real you is inside without considering your body in any way. But your body isn't everything. It's a real part of you, but it's not the whole you. 
In our main text for this evening, 1 Corinthians 6, um, Paul really reinforces that and draws some implications for us. Um, it might have seemed like a slightly random reading to have to be talking about sex and prostitution and that kind of thing. It just so happens to be the issue that Paul was addressing in Corinth, um, where effectively um, the Corinthians were were saying, God doesn't care about our bodies. We can use them however we want. The, the bit that God is really interested in is the spirit, is the bit inside. So we'll do whatever we want with our bodies. And Paul says this to them. Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You were bought at a price, therefore honour God with your bodies. And notice, um, notice how Paul equates you with your body and he does it twice in consecutive verses you can't conceive of you as the inner self and your body as something different your body is an essential part of who you are there is no ian lingwood without this body no ian lingwood without this body it'll be different in the resurrection but it will still be my body it won't be this, bo this body, but it will still be this body glorified. And Paul goes on to, to draw some implications for us about how we are then to control our bodies and um, use our wills to control our bodily desires. He says of the Corinthians, you say, and they have this proverb, this pithy proverb, food for the stomach and a stomach for food and God will destroy them both. In other words, God doesn't really care about the body in the long term. The body is just something for now. And so food for the stomach, the stomach for food. And the Corinthians were using that saying uh, not about their eating. They were using it about their sex lives. They were effectively saying, oh, our physical existence, God's going to destroy it. It doesn't really matter in the end. So we can do whatever we want. Paul corrects them. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. In other words, God cares about your bodies because your body is a real part of who you are. It is a real part of who you are. And so we're called, um, as Paul does, to exercise self-control over our bodies. Now, you're wondering why on earth is an image of a toddler looking into a potty. Now, whether we've ever been parents or not, this is a picture that we are all, well, we might not be familiar with, but we've all been through it at some point in our lives. As young children, at whatever age it was, we have all at some point had to learn to exercise our will over our bodily function. To, to put it crudely, we had to learn not to do wee wee and poo poo whenever we wanted to. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to make everyone snigger, but, but that's the reality of it, isn't it? And a bodily reality, we have all had to learn at some point that we use our will to control our bodily function in a way that is appropriate to us as human beings. That going to the toilet is a private thing. And we have to learn to act and, and use it in that way. Now, in a similar way, Paul calls the Corinthians to exercise self-control over their bodies. Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you. You were bought at a price, so honour God with your bodies. How are you to do that? The truth of scripture in, informs your mind and you're to then use your mind and will to exercise control over your body sexually. In other words, what is Paul saying? What's the, what's the upshot of all this stuff? God really cares about how you use your body, whether it's regard to sex or anything else, whether it's um, alcohol consumption or caffeine consumption or, or binge eating or whatever it might be. God cares about our bodies because they're a real part of who you are. You can't just strip it away as if God doesn't care the end of the day, he's the one who gave you your body. The, the one that you inhabit now. You're never going to have another one, a different one. Even in the new creation, it's going to be your body. 
glorified, raised to resurrection life. God cares about how we use our bodies, and so we should as well. Now, lots of what I was speaking about earlier, about these people who effectively say the soul is all that matters and that the body isn't really part of you, um, is behind so much of what stands with the transgender movement. The transgender movement, which effectively says, oh, the, the body is the wrong body. It isn't really a part of you, so you can, you can do with it exactly what you want to. And to do that is to denigrate the bodies that God has given to us as a gift and the, the ultimate stamp of approval that God has placed on our created bodies. I don't know if you thought about this, but the New Testament gives a radical stamp of approval on our created bodies, on our physical bodies, and it does it in two different ways. The first is at the crib, the manger. There are verses that that are full of theological significance, but often we just slightly skip over in the creation narrative. Have a look in, in the booklets. So, sorry, I for, forgot to put the verses actually on the, on the screen. Um, Luke 2, verse 6. Astonishing words when you stop to reflect on them. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Amazing words when you stop to dwell on it, because they are God's radical stamp of approval on our bodies. When the eternal son came to dwell among us, full of grace and truth, he didn't come as a spirit, he didn't come as an angel or an animal, he came as one of us as a human being and inhabited his own flesh and blood, his own body, truly human. And so in the um, incarnation, theologians call it, the coming of Jesus among us as a human being, we have God's stamp of approval on our bodies. And then if that's the first stamp, the second is the resurrection. I love this story from the end of Luke's gospel where Jesus meets the disciples and they think he's a ghost. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled. They were frightened because they thought they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet where the nail marks had been. It is I myself. Touch me and see. What an invitation. <laughs> a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Jesus coming as a human being, stamp number one of approval on our bodies. Jesus being raised with physical flesh, stamp number two of approval on our physical bodies as a reality that will endure into the new creation. We saw that as we looked at 1 Corinthians 15 in our series before Easter and that there is a fundamental continuity between the natural body that we have now and the supernatural body still to come. So as we close, some implications. I want to speak carefully here, but truthfully and honestly, we should view as sub-Christian any movement or ideology which denies the goodness of any person's body as a gift of God in creation. God says, your body is good. It is a gift that he has given to you, to you and to you alone. And he's put his stamp of, of approval on that by sending his own son as a human being and in him rising from the dead. So any movement, no matter how spiritual it might claim to be, however loving it might claim to be, however Christian it might claim to be, any movement that denies the goodness of your body as a gift of God is sub-Christian. Second, we ought to cultivate thankfulness for our own bodies rather than envy at others. I think we all struggle with this in different ways because we all have a checkered relationship with our own body. We'll think about why that is and how to live with it later on in our series. But the Christian response to 
what we've seen today is thankfulness. God's given us a body as a gift. Your body is unique of the nearly seven billion specimens that exist on this planet. You are the only one with your body. God has made you unique and special. And it's not just your inner self, your soul, and your will and everything that goes with that that makes you unique. It is your body. And it is a Christian virtue to be able to be thankful for that. Third, as we've seen from 1 Corinthians 6, we should, within our creaturely limits, use our will to control our bodies in ways that, that glorify God, that honour him, that, as Rosemary pointed out, I should have put a capital G on God there, type A, in God-glorifying ways. And one, you know, we've seen that from 1 Corinthians 6, haven't we? Particularly now, in light of the resurrection, um, and the fact that, that the Spirit of God has come to live in us. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. God cares about our bodies and how we use them. And lastly, and almost by way of an aside, but I think an important point to address. If our bodies aren't a really part of who we are, then suffering is meaningless. Right? Our suffering has meaning and only if our bodies have dignity. Only if our bodies are really part of who we are. When we go through suffering, our natural response is not to think, oh, I just need to elevate myself above this. Pretend it's not real. The more authentic experience is to groan with it as we realise that the physical suffering that we endure is something that we endure, not just that our bodies, as some detached reality, endure. That... Um, is where we're drawing stumps. And it was an exercise in a way of um, spinning a lot of plates. I realise I've covered a lot of ground, gone over a lot of topics. And if you will, I've started a lot of plates spinning. Over the course of the next five weeks, the aim is that we'll come to each one of those plates and, and grab them and take a closer look at it and some of the implications of it. So, so next week, we're going to carry on this series we start thinking about our bodies, we're going to think about what it is to be male and female. But more of that next week, and I'm going to hand over to Philip as we close.